Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Carrie Bedient, and this is your video so that we can go through all the things that happen in retrieval because it took me 15 years to be able to get all of this down to a fairly concise explanation. And so when I'm talking about this with you in the office, I don't expect you to remember everything I'm saying. This is why I'm making the video so that you have something to go back to and refer to when you have questions mid retrieval um, so that you don't have to wait on us. So here we go. Once we decide that you are a good candidate for IVF and that that is what our plan is going to be, one of the first things we want to do is make sure that you have the pituitary stim test. This is giving you the trigger medications we use so that when we get to the point of actually triggering you in the stim, we have an idea how to dose, how to dose medications. So you're going to take these medications, typically HCG and Lupron. There can be brand names, so, that, so sometimes they're a little bit different, but those are the underlying meds. You're gonna take those in the evening, and the next morning we're gonna come back and we're gonna check blood work to make sure that you got the response that we think you should have had, and if you didn't, we know how to alter it going forward. Once you have the pituitary stim test, oftentimes we will put you on a birth control pill and then roughly two weeks later start on your, um, your stim medications. Now, this does not apply to everyone. And it's true as we are going through all of this that I'm explaining the kitchen sink here. Everyone is not the same as everyone else. So I am tailoring what we're doing to your body and your lab results and what we think is best for you. So if you hear me mention something, then you're, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't get that there's a reason you didn't get it. It's because we tried to tailor things to what is best for you and your body. Okay. So you've done the pituitary stim test. Now, some patients are going to need pretreatment and that is typically in the form of either a birth control pill or sometimes estrogen pills, or sometimes cetratide, which is an injection. The purpose of pretreatment in whatever form it takes is to suppress your FSH levels and your estrogen levels from what your body is producing so that when we start the stim, we are starting at a low level. So some people, they operate at a higher level because their body is pushing, pushing, pushing to get those eggs made and the, and the ovaries are saying, screw you, I'm not listening. And so their levels of these hormones are operating up here. I don't want them up there before we start. I want to drop them down. So that's why we do the pretreatment. So it's usually somewhere around 10 days to two weeks of medications that help drop those levels. Now, once we see that everything has dropped, we're going to start you on the stim process itself. And this is something that pretty much everybody's going to go through. You're going to come in for a baseline ultrasound. Oftentimes this correlates to when you have your period. So you'll get your period, you'll call our coordinators and we will bring you in shortly thereafter for your baseline. That is a vaginal ultrasound and labs. The purpose of this ultrasound is to make sure we are starting off on a clean slate and that there's no big cysts in there. There's no wonkiness with the hormone levels that everything is as it should be. Once we see that that looks good, we are then going to have you start taking medications. These medications are usually some combination of FSH, Bolistim and Gonalef are the brand names for that, and Menopure. Sometimes I will add in Clomid, which is a pill. Sometimes we will add in Lupron early on, which is another injections. The goal of all of the medications that we are giving is to increase your body's FSH levels. And what that does is that gives a stronger set of instructions for your ovaries so that they grow more eggs and we get as many as we can. You are going to be giving yourself these injections every day for about two weeks. During this time, you're going to come in for lots of labs and lots of ultrasounds. I was telling everybody, you're gonna know my whole staff by the end of this because IVF is very much a team sport. And so you'll come in in the morning, you'll see my ultrasonographers and phlebotomists, they will get your ultrasound and your blood work and then you will go about your day. About early afternoon, I am going to get your results and look at them and say, okay, this is what needs to happen next. Come back in two days, ready for trigger, whatever it may be. My coordinators will give you a call and touch base with you or send you a note through the portal more likely. And then we will have you do whatever it is and we'll see you at the next monitoring visit. There's anywhere from, I would say about, four to seven monitoring visits, give or take, for someone who's going through. 
For some people, there may be less because they respond a little bit faster. For some people, there may be more than that because they're responding slower and we're watching a little bit more closely. It really depends on what your body is doing. Because again, we tailor it to you, not to a cookie cutter. Once we see that your eggs are nice and big, we will then say, please take a trigger shot. And the trigger shot is the eviction notice for the eggs. Tells them to grow up and get out. Two days after the trigger shot, we will do the retrieval. Now, we are going to give you a very specific time for the trigger shot because we schedule the retrieval time based off of that. So most of your injections, you're going to take about the same time every evening. But for the trigger shot, we are going to be very explicit. Please take this at X time. Once you take the trigger shot, um, we'll have a pre-op appointment in there and we'll go through, through all of the things to expect there. And then on the day of retrieval, nothing to eat or drink the night before after midnight. No coffee, tea, or water when you come in in the morning. When you get here, we will get you set up with a beautiful designer gown, matching hat and booties, an IV for the best cocktails you've ever had before noon, and then once everybody's ready and you are comfortable and asleep, we will go in with an ultrasound with a special needle on the end, pick up as many of those eggs as we can get. After the procedure, you will come back to our recovery room and we will make sure that you're feeling okay. And then you'll go home. No driving that day. No major life decisions. No taking care of other human beings, large or small. No going down to the strip, no gambling and no dancing on tables. Okay. Okay. You will hear me say that multiple times throughout this process. Um, once you are done, we're going to have your partner give a sperm sample the same day, if that's what's applying to you. And then I would like for him to have not ejaculated for two to five days before the, the trigger. Um, and so he'll come in, we'll prepare the sperm. Now, what happens next in the laboratory, because you're done at this point, what happens next in the laboratory is that the lab is going to clean the eggs they will determine how many are mature. Not every egg is gonna be mature. We know that and we expect that. They are then gonna fertilize in a process called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And this is something that we do on all the eggs and it takes the best looking sperm. So the ones that pass both the beauty competition and the talent competition, and it directly combines them with the egg. Now this gives the best chance for fertilization because it means that they are hanging out right next to each other. It doesn't guarantee fertilization. There are parts of this process that no matter how good we are, we still have to let the universe take over and just see what happens. The day after your retrieval, you will get an email from the lab that says, this is how many eggs you got, this is how many are mature, and this is how many fertilized. Expect those numbers to start decreasing. That is normal. That is why I go for as many eggs as I can possibly get from the beginning, because I know that there is a funnel effect as we do this. You're gonna see this many eggs on ultrasound. This many eggs are gonna come out. This many eggs will be mature, will fertilize, will start to grow, will become good embryos, and will pass genetic testing, if you do genetic testing. I know that that funnel effect is gonna happen. It happens with my best donors. It happens with everybody and it's okay. And so when you see that your count goes from maybe 10 eggs down to one or two embryos, it's okay, all right? And expect that to happen. If you are doing genetic testing, at the end of that week, once we know how many embryos have grown out, we will do a biopsy of the embryos and we will take out four to five of those cells and send them to a specialty genetics lab. They are going to tell us whether or not the embryos have 46 chromosomes, no more, no less. We will also find out gender at this point. Now, we can't change what any of these results are. So if you want all boys and we get all girls, there's not a thing we can do about that or vice versa. Um, but if you have both boys and girls and you want us to transfer one or the other, it's fine by me. Um, once we get those genetic testing results, we will sit down and have a conversation and we will go through what happens next for transfer. That is a separate video. Um, again, I expect the numbers to go down. That's fine. Things that the genetic testing can tell us, and this is just a general overview, they can tell us if there's too many or too few chromosomes. So things like Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, and other abnormalities like those, those will be picked up. This will not pick up things like cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, or any of those other carrier conditions, unless we are doing a specialty genetic testing called PGTM.
This applies to very limited patients. Um, most of our patients do not need this. And so if you do need it, we will have had many conversations ahead of time about this. So most people are getting PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, all right? Now, things to know about the retrieval and the medications that we use. For side effects of the medications, these medications are designed to help your ovaries function at a maximal level. So it's the medications themselves don't do anything. So for example, if I gave these medications to a woman with menopausal whose ovaries didn't function at all, she wouldn't know the difference if she was taking them or not. When we give them to someone who does have functioning ovaries, like most of our patients, um, it's going to increase their estrogen levels because their eggs are going to be growing and their eggs will be producing more estrogen. This can lead to hot flashes, mood swings, um, nausea, breast tenderness, feeling hormonal, okay? The really scary risks that we talk about are blood clot and stroke. These happen far less than 1% of the time, but they are possible, so we still talk about them. Far and away, what most of my patients feel is bloating, okay? Your ovaries become your ovaries throughout this process. It takes two weeks to grow up to that point, and it's going to take at least another two weeks to go back down to normal. And so it's going to feel like you had three Thanksgiving dinners and you have not yet gone to the bathroom. Um, this is different than pain. It is discomfort. So for example, if I tell you to take ibuprofen, that's going to help with pain after a retrieval. It's not going to touch the bloating. And so many people are displeased by that um, because they feel so bloated. So I always tell everybody, don't plan on wearing your skinny jeans. Get your comfy skirts, your sweatpants, all of those things, and, and prepare to feel big and it will go away. Usually by the time you get your period, roughly 10 to 14 days after the retrieval, um, you start to feel considerably more like yourself and you're like 80% back to normal or so, okay? After the retrieval itself, anytime we do a procedure, there's always the risk of bleeding, infection, and damage to other organs in the, uh, in the area. Things like blood vessels, bowel, and bladder. This does not happen often, again, less than 1% of the time, but it is possible, and so we talk about it. Afterwards, we bring you out to the recovery room. Now, we will go through the spiel of take ibuprofen, usually about 600 milligrams, that's three tablets you can get over the counter, every six hours with a little bit of food, okay? That can be very helpful. Now, constipation is very much the enemy here because your ovaries are now your ovaries and they're competing for space in that tiny little tummy of yours. And so when you have constipation, you've got more stool in there and it's all fighting for very limited real estate. So if you notice that you are constipated at all, even just heading in that direction, start to take Miralax. It's one cap full of a powder every day. You don't, it doesn't taste like anything. It doesn't smell like anything. And it will help keep you hydrated as well because you just dissolve it in eight ounces of water or juice, okay? That is very helpful in avoiding issues. I also recommend that you sleep with some pillows behind you. So instead of lying down flat afterwards, you're kind of on an incline. That will keep any fluid low as opposed to tracking up and hitting right under your diaphragm, which can irritate your shoulder and feel like your chest is tight. So it won't harm you, but it's very unpleasant. And so that's why I recommend sleeping kind of upright. So constipation management, sleep upright and ibuprofen, all right? Once we have the retrieval done, we are then going to get an email from the lab the day after. We'll get an email from a lab the week after with our final embryo freezing numbers. And if you're doing genetic testing, about two weeks after that, we will get all those results. And so then we sit down and we go through everything. Success rates are wildly dependent on what your testing was before coming into IVF. And so someone who's young typically has uh, different success rates than someone who is older than 35. Um, and so we will talk about all of that. It's pretty universally true to expect a decrease in the numbers as you are going through, because that's why we go for as many as we can get. When people ask me how many eggs do I expect, it's really dependent on what your egg numbers were going in. My goal is to get everything that is there, but even though we are in Las Vegas and magic is everywhere, it's not that kind of magic. I can't make something appear out of nothing. No one can. So our goal is to grow what is there and to support what is there and then to get it out. Now, reasons a cycle could get canceled. Sometimes people come in and they've got a big cyst growing. So we need to give it some time to let it go down with birth control, sometimes with other medications. Sometimes they get sick in the middle of the cycle. If you have fevers, we're probably gonna cancel the cycle because eggs aren't really crazy about fevers. 
um, if you ovulate early. Now, we give medications to prevent ovulation. So by the time you're several days into medications, we will have you usually start something called cetratide um, or Ganarelix, and that prevents the ovulation. This is not necessarily true for people who are on Lupron flares because you already have Lupron that's suppressing things, okay? So even when we give the cetratide, occasionally someone will break through that and they will ovulate. We're watching your labs to see if we can prevent that, if we need to increase the dose, but it can still happen. And it usually happens maybe once, once or twice a year. When that happens, we just stop and we reset and we plan to do it again. All right. So there's a whole, whole list of all of these things. Um, the person who does your retrieval will be whichever doc is on call that day. So it is most important to me that we are going with your body and what is best for your body, not what is best for my schedule. And so my partners, Dr. K and Dr. Shapiro and I all rotate. So we always have a doc on deck, ready to go, no matter what day your retrieval comes up. And that way we are set and ready to go and you are not at the mercy of my schedule. We can go by what is best for your body. Okay. Um, the anesthesia that we give is just sedation. You don't usually have a tube down your throat. You're breathing on your own. Um, and we have an anesthetist who's monitoring you the whole time. And so her, her entire job is to pay attention to you and your breathing to make sure that everything is good. All right. I hope that this is helpful. I hope that hearing this a second time um, makes it a little bit easier for you to know what's going on. And I hope all goes well. We'll see you soon. Bye now.